So what we're discussing today uh, would be about syphilis and other treponematoses, but we will mostly con uh, concentrating on syphilis, syphilis or the treponema pallidum, which means that for other treponematoses, you shall be reading your book. So anyway, um, let's start first with the discussion on spirochetes. For those of you who have already finished bacteriology, um, you know for a fact that when we speak of spirochetes or the family spirochetales, three important genera should actually come into your mind. And these are the genus Treponema, genus Borrelia, and genus Leptospira. So they are characterized as thin walled and they are flexible spiral or helical shaped rods. Um, the reason why they are motile is because of the fact that they have eggshell filaments. The eggshell filaments is the one that is responsible for the so-called cork screw motility. So sometimes this eggshell filament is also known as the endoflagellum. So the endoflagellum. So which means that, for example, that this would be the organisms so the, the flagellum would usually start here and end here. So that's the reason why um, they are also known as the amphitrichus flagella. Are you familiar with the amphitrichus? Okay. Which means that there's a single flagellum at both ends. So that would be responsible for that would be responsible for the corkscrew motility of the spirochetes. Um, the organisms are facultative anaerobe and they multiplied by means of transverse fission. So dark field microscopy is one of the one of the tests that will allow us to have direct examinations of the organisms. It's quite difficult to stain them using gram stain. So we cannot possibly use gram stain. So we could either use a silver stain or a gold stain for for demonstration of for the demonstration of of Treponema pallidum. So silver stain, this is how they look like. Um, Levodipy stain is actually one of the examples of the silver stain that we could possibly use. And then um, Treponema is characterized with numerous tights, rigid coils, and helical shapes. That I did mention that a while ago. So Treponema would only infect humans. So which means that you cannot find you cannot get syphilis by having a sexual intercourse with chimpanzee, manatee, or baboons. So you can only get them from humans. Okay? And then, they are not cultivated on artificial media. Um, there are several subspecies. The Treponema pallidum subspecies pallidum would cause syphilis. This is the only venereal infection. The rest of Treponema species are non-venereal. Examples are the Pertenu or the Yos or the Fambricia and then the Begel syphilis and the other one is the Karasium this one could cause Pinta so syphilis um, was known as the Great Pax during the French-Italian War Italian call it French disease and French call it Italian disease so there is quite an irony uh, when it comes to syphilis so, so this means that um, syphilis, syphilis. Um, usually during that French-Italian War, if I'm not mistaken, um, the Italians are sending French prostitutes to infect, to infect the. Uh, uh, I mean, the Italians are sending Italian prostitutes to infect French soldiers. So I think this is one of the earliest recorded biological warfare. So aside from sexual intercourse, syphilis could be transmitted by blood transfusion, and it is also congenital. It is noteworthy to mention, though, that if the blood has been stored in the refrigerator for three days, for three days, the organisms would become unstable. So most of the time, syphilis is being, um, the, the risk of, trans, of transmitting syphilis via blood transfusion would be by means of fresh, whole blood transfusion. Okay. Now, that's the reason why also, Syphilis is one of the screening tests that we're using for blood donors before we allow them to donate blood. 
So you have to assure your recipients that the donor is actually free from syphilis. So the incubation days, uh, the incubation period is between 3 to 90 days or an average of 3 weeks. Um, there are actually four stages of syphilis. Um, we have the primary, the secondary, the latent, and the tertiary stage. The primary stage is characterized by the development of hard chancre. Hard chancre, also known as the Hunterian chancre. I'd like to give emphasis on the chancre because, because um, there is also what you call soft chancre. And soft chancre is caused by Haemophilus ducreyi. So hard chancre is caused by Treponema pallidum. Um, it appears 10 to 10 days, up to several months after the incubation period. And chancre, most of the time, people will not, uh, will, not, uh, will not pay attention to it because they are painless. Okay, the chancre is actually clean, smooth based. The edge is raised, firm, and it is painless. So if it's painless, people will not take care of it. So for diagnostic purposes, you can actually swab the, swab the chancre and do the direct microscopic examination by means of dark field microscopy, levaditis silver impregnation, that is your silver stain, and the other one is the gold stain. So your gold stain is the Fontana Tribondu stain. So that is your gold stain. So during this stage, um, there are also serological tests that is available. So the serological test okay, is, our, is known as the rapid plasma regime. This is an example of non-treponemal test. So we will be discussing that later on. And then we also, aside from that, we also have the FTA-ABS and then the MHATP. So this is an example of a chancre. So it is the pain, clean, smooth, smooth, the edge is raised, and it is painless. So this is at the, this chancre is found at the labia. Do you know that syphilis is one of the sexually transmitted disease wherein even a condom will not protect you from getting it because it is not by means of transmission of fluid but usually by direct contact unless your condom shapes like a cycling short or shake like a jogging pants so that's the only way where it could actually protect you but is there already a condom that like a cycling short? Have you ever seen one? Oh, wait lang ha. Wait lang. Magsusuot lang ako ng condom. <laughs> like parang jogging pass or cycling. So it will not actually protect you. So if you're able to have your, if you are able to have a contact with that particular chancre, that chancre is highly infectious. It contains organisms and it's a manifestations that the organisms had penetrated your genitalia. So, chancre could also be seen, of course, in males. So, this is an example of a chancre, again, in male. Okay. Um, several multi, multiple chancres. Um, chancre at the shaft. So, if you're black, so it will appear red. So, it's, it's kind of obvious. And then, oh, if you've been involved in... In oral sex, in medical term, we call it fellatio. Okay, so there is a possibility also that you'll get chancre in the oral cavity. Okay, so much for the chancre. Okay, so after the primary stage, if a person hasn't been involved, hasn't been drinking antibiotics, the next stage would be the secondary stage. Um, the secondary stage is characterized by several signs and symptoms. And one of them is the presence of maculopapular rash. So there would be rashes in the skin, um, particularly at the palms, sole, even the presence of white mucus patches or otherwise known as the condyloma lata. So it's a wart-like lesion found in the genitalia. There would also be loss of hair and thinning of eyebrow, although I'd like to make emphasis that not all people who've lost their hair is due to syphilis. <laughs> so, anyway, um, there could also be involvement of the central nervous system, eyes, bones, and liver. So, as you notice, secondary stage could actually be multi-organ, could actually be systemic. So these are examples of white 
um, mucous patches found in the tongue. Secondary stage lesions in the face, all over the body. That has already, these lesions have already spread in the palm of the hand. Um, this is the word like lesion found at the anus. Lesions, okay, at the sole of the feet. And sometimes people would actually lost their hair. Okay, but I'd like to emphasize again that not all people who have lost their hair have syphilis. Okay, then after the secondary stage, you have now come to the Latin stage. In the Latin stage, the disease becomes subclinical. So all the while, these people would have thought that, oh, they have already been cured from syphilis. Not knowing that it has already reached the stage wherein they will not be able to show any signs and the disease is recognized only through serological tests. So this is where that med text would come in because people would go to your laboratory to donate blood not showing any signs and symptoms of having syphilis. Of course, you cannot expect their genitalia to see any chancre or you cannot, sometimes the lesions are not seen in the body. So this is now the weapon of medical technologies. So the medical technologies will extract blood and try to find out if these people who wish to donate blood have antibodies against syphilis. That's the reason why medical technologies are also known as the eye of medicine. So, tertiary stage is the next stage. In the tertiary stage, In the tertiary stage, it takes place when the Latin stage is not treated. So very important that the first sign that you've seen syphilis, you have to treat it. If, if, you've able to, if you're able to treat it during the primary stage, then it will not go to the secondary stage. So the tertiary stage takes place when the Latin stage is not treated. So there would be involvement of deep organ. So there would be cardiac syphilis, neurosyphilis, or... And one of the manifestations would be a physical deformity. And this physical deformity is known as the gamas. In some other books, you'll be able to hear the term gamata. So gamas, gamata, they're actually all the same. So other internal organs involvement would include the bone and the skin. So here you can see the facial deformity of people with syphilis. So this is now what you call the deformity, okay? So... Um, this is one of the reasons why some people will, uh, will not actually um, be that enthusiastic in, in drinking antibiotics for syphilis because of the adverse reaction known as the jerichs herxheimer reaction. So this is known as, this is commonly observed among people who, who are particularly at the early stage of syphilis. So usually whenever they are being treated with penicillin, or penicillin or heavy metals, 2 to 12 hours after the treatment, they would have reaction toward the said antibiotic. So they're being discouraged, therefore, to take the, the succeeding dosages of the antibiotics. So most commonly observed reactions include having headache, malay, temperature above 38 degrees. So this, is, this reaction is known as the jerichs herxheimer reaction. Um, congenital syphilis is a sad thing because this involves innocent children. These innocent children has been born from mother who has, who's, uh, who has been infected already with syphilis. So congenital syphilis, therefore, is de defined as a transmission of the disease. So this is what you call vertical transmission okay, from syphilitic mother to the fetus via the placenta. So worst case scenario would be fetal death. Uh, however, um, there are actually three stages of syphilis, of congenital syphilis, the early, late, and stigmata. The stigmata stage means that there has already been deformities on the part of the infected child. So this stigmata could be in the form of interstitial keratitis, saddle nose, or periodontitis, Hutchinson's teeth, or CNS anomalies. So these are all examples of these are all examples of, of stigmata characterized by different deformities. So here is an example of Hutchinson's teeth, one of the complications of having congenital syphilis. 
this interstitial keratitis could actually lead to blindness. So that's the reason why we use we usually place antibiotics whenever a child is being born, whether the mother has history or not of having congenital or having a sexually transmitted infection. A saddle nose, so this is another example. Okay, what is a neurosyphilis? Neurosyphilis is actually part of the tertiary stage. This happens when, when the organism would, would actually uh, invade the central nervous system. And there are actually uh, four stages of neurosyphilis. The first stage is known as the asymptomatic stage. Um, during a symptomatic stage, of course, obviously, the patients will not show any sign and symptom. Then it will now go to your blood, okay, and eventually to the meninges. So that is known as the meningovascular syphilis. And then the third stage is known as the tabes dorsalis. Here in the tabes dorsalis, there would be loss of motor functions. You will not be able to control your gait. When I say gait, I'm referring to GAID or your ability to walk straight. And then, your, and then general paresis means general paralysis. So a person uh, will be par paralyzed as a result of neurosyphilis. Okay, so anyway, so here's an example of a brain autopsy with neurosyphilis. So tabes dorsalis is the third stage. It's a slow degeneration of the nerve cells and nerve fibers. They're important because these nerve fibers would carry sensory information to the brain. Now, if these sensory nerves have been destroyed by the organism, then motor functions would be affected. So tabes dorsalis is the result of an untreated syphilis infection. So symptoms would include weakness, diminished reflex, unsteady gait, that's what I've been telling you a while ago, we cannot walk straight, progressive degeneration of the joints, and loss of coordination. So eventually, there would be intense episodes of pain, disturbed sensation, personality changes, dementia, deafness, visual impairment, impaired response to light. So you, as you can see, no, during the early stage, you'll just have a shanker. Uh, it is not painful, but what is worse would be the complications brought about by having a syphilis. If left untreated, tabes dorsalis can lead to paralysis, dementia, and blindness. So, as you can see in the last bullet, it says here, it says there, existing nerve damage cannot be reversed, which means that it is irreparable. Once your nerve damage has been repaired, it will be, it will not go back to normal. Which means it's like trust. Trust is like trust is like a high man. Once damaged, it is beyond repair. Who, hashtag who goat. Okay, so this is an autopsy. Okay, an autopsy uh, of the brain. Okay, showing um, a CNS damage. So, okay, so let's now proceed to the types of serological tests. Um, there are several serological tests available for the treatment of syphilis. So, uh, for the diag not treatment, diagnosis, okay, I'm sorry, for the diagnosis of syphilis. So, um, one would be by means of antigen detection. So, antigen detection involved microscopic examination. So you can swab the lesion and do the microscopic examination, such as dark field microscopy. Okay. Okay. Aside from dark field microscopy, you can also do the DFATP. DFATP stands for direct fluorescent assay treponema pallidum. Uh, we have already discussed DFA, right? In serological reactions. So, yeah. So... And then um, DFA TP histopath, which means that you get you get a certain portion or a biopsy sample. Okay, isolation and propagation. What does it mean? When you say isolation and propagation, 
um, we culture the organisms. However, syphilis or Treponema pallidum cannot be cultured using ordinary artificial culture medium. So you have to infect rabbit. You have to infect rabbit. What if you cannot find a rabbit? Uh, you can do the classmate infectivity testing. Hindi, joke lang. Huwag niyo isulat yun. Kala ko sinusulat. Okay, so rabbit infectivity testing. Naka-record pala ako. Okay, number three would be the nucleic acid amplification technique. So this involves PCR. Okay, so you amplify you amplify uh, the target DNA. So which means that you have to have a specific primer uh, that would design to amplify the target genes, okay, a tri- uh, target genes of Treponema pallidum. And then, of course, it's actually much cheaper and easier to do antibody detection. In antibody detection, it's further divided into two. You have the non-treponemal test, and the other one is the treponemal test. So, you have the non-treponemal and then the treponemal test. So, before we go on, um, um, this is an example of a rabbit infectivity test. So, you have here a rabbit specimen, and then you infect the rabbit. And then the rabbit will have now the shunter. Um, um, the advantage is that you can have live microorganisms, and live microorganisms can be used for antibody testing, such as in Treponema pallidum immobilization. The disadvantage, of course, you have to get clearance for animal ethics. Okay, you have to get. So, is there really a need to infect the rabbit? So that's one of the things that would be asked for rabbit infectivity testing. And so you'll be infecting rabbit in rabbit infectivity testing. Oh, this one you have the eye. Okay. So yeah, it's another shanker found in the rabbit. So if you're going to examine the lesion, these are the organisms that came from the rabbit. Okay. Now antibody detection test for syphilis is divided into two non treponemal and the other one is treponemal test. What's the difference? In non treponemal test, the source of antigen is known as the cardiolipin. Okay? Cardiolipin is actually lipid by nature. So, uh, it, uh, the reason why we call it cardiolipin because it is extracted from the beef heart. Okay? So, it is a beef heart extract. So, cardiolipin will detect Reagent. So reagent would usually be present whenever a person has syphilis. Okay. It is a screening test, which means that it is not confirmatory. So if you've been positive for the uh, treponemal test, it doesn't really mean that you have syphilis already. For non-treponemal test, sorry. If you've been positive for non-treponemal test, it doesn't mean that you have syphilis. So it is sometimes there's a chance that you'll have false positive results. So it's not non-confirmatory. Example would be the Wasserman test, the Colmer test. Do you know this Wasserman test? Um, it's quite difficult um, because in Wasserman test, you have, to ex- you, have to get, you have to get the antigen from the liver of, of the fetus that had died from congenital syphilis. Do you know where to get it? Imagine you have to you have to find a fetus, <laughs> and that fetus um, should have died from congenital syphilis. Get the fetus, and then get the liver of that fetus, and that antigen would be the source of the Wasserman test or the Wasserman antigen. And it's quite it's quite difficult. So that's why nowadays Wasserman test, the Colmer test, though they are complement fixation tests, they are not being performed anymore. So, what is common is a flocculation test. Flocculation test, um, there are actually two types. We have the VDRL, or the Venereal Disease Research Laboratory, and the other one is the RPR, or the Rapid Plasma Ray Gene. The VDRL test and RPR are examples of flocculation tests. Now, what is a flocculation test? Most of the students would think that Flocculation test is an agglutination test. No, it is not an agglutination test, okay? Flocculation test is a low-grade precipitation reaction. 
Okay? So, low-grade precipitation reaction. So, flocculation is not an agglutination test. Okay. The other one is what you call the treponemal test. In the treponemal test, the source of antigen is the actual organism itself. So, the source of antigen is treponema pallidum. So, it is the actual organism and it detects treponemal anti antibodies, either the IgG or IgM, and it is confirmatory. So, which means that if you are positive for treponemal test, hashtag alam na this. So, alam niyo na, na yeah, you have syphilis. Hindi niyo na magpagkakaila. Okay? So, examples would include um, fluorescent treponemal antibody absorption, treponema pallidum immobilization, treponema pallidum complement fixation, microhemagglutination treponema pallidum, and treponema pallidum hemagglutination. So, these are just examples of the treponemal test for syphilis. Okay, so let's compare the different types of flocculation tests. So the two most common are the classical VDRL and the RPR VDRL. I say classical because nowadays we have a latex VDRL, which is different from classical VDRL. So what's, what's the important thing that you have to remember about the classical VDRL? In classical VDRL, you have to remember that this requires inactivation of serum. So when you say inactivation of serum, you have to heat the serum at 56 degrees centigrade for 30 minutes. And the purpose of heating the serum at 56 degrees for 30 minutes is to destroy native complement. Okay, so you can destroy native complement. You can read the result macroscopically and microscopically after about 8 minutes and the positive result is characterized by flocculation. So why do we need to destroy the native complement? What do you mean by native complement? Native complement are those complements that are existing on the serum of the patient. And this native complement may interfere with the results. So that's the reason why we have to, we have to destroy them by means of heat inactivation. On the other hand, Rapid plasma reagent detects reagent. It is an antibody that is found to be positive whenever a person has syphilis, though it may be subjective to false biological false positive results. So both of these tests, though, are not really confirmatory, as what I've mentioned to you a while ago. Now, the reason why we call it rapid is because of the fact that there is no need for inactivation of serum. So there's no need for inactivation of serum. Why? Because in this flocculation test, you are using a charcoal indicator. And then this indicator has been, uh, has been absorbed with choline chloride. And then this choline chloride will actually prevent interference. Hence, there's no need for you to inactivate the serum. So the results are also read within four minutes and a positive result is characterized by flocculation. So this is an example of this is an example of the of the RPR test. Um, you have to search that you have to read your insert in the laboratory that there is certain gauge of needle that is needed for antigen delivery. So how do you tell a positive result? A positive result is reported as reactive. So this is an example of flocculation. So this is weakly reactive and this is non-reactive. When you report, you do not say positive or negative. You say reactive or non-reactive. Why? Because this is not confirmatory. So just say you are reactive to the antibodies. You are non-reactive to the antibodies. You do not say positive or negative for syphilis. Because there is no way for you to tell positive or negative for syphilis by just performing the non-treponemal test. Non-treponemal tests are non-treponemal tests are non-confirmatory. Um, here you now have the VDRL latex. Unlike the classical VDRL wherein 
you have to prepare an antigen suspension and then the antigen suspension would only last for 24 hours. So it's quite, uh, sometimes reagents are being wasted if you're doing the VDRL, the classical VDRL. This time we have the VDRL latex. Unlike VDRL, classical VDRL, there's no need for inactivation. So there's no need for inactivation, meaning you do not have to heat the serum at 56 degrees, 56 degrees centigrade for 30 minutes. So there's no need for you to do heat inactivation. And you can also interpret the results both macroscopically and microscopically, though it is ideal to do it microscopically. So here is an example of a past of a reactive result. Reactive result. Here is an example of non reactive result for syphilis. So, anyway, um, by the way, whenever you do the, uh, I'd like to give emphasis that when you do, have you, did, have you done RPR in the lab? Yes. Okay. How did you do it? You add serum, right? And then you deliver the antigen. And then what did you do? Did you mix it? Did you mix the suspension? Yes, very good. You do not mix. If it's, RP, if it's ASO, CRP, you can do it. You can do mixing. Diba? If you notice, in RPR, you are not being provided with a mixing stick because you're not supposed to mix antigen and the serum of the patient because you have to place them in the mechanical slide rotator. You have it here, right? The slide rotator. So you have to do it using a slide rotator. So you do not mix it. So in RPR, the background is white because charcoal is black. So here is another example of macroscopic examination or macroscopic result for RPR. So here you have reactive result, RPR. Then the test limitation of RPR, you cannot use it for CSF, which means you cannot use, you cannot diagnose it for neurosyphilis. If you want to use it for CSF, then you have to do the VDRL. Um, prozone may be encountered. Prozone is an excess antibody, so you have to do serum dilution. Reactive also in YOS and non-venereal syphilis. YOS are examples of non-venereal syphilis. It may result into biological false positive result. Okay. Next one is FDA ABS. What is this one? FDA ABS um, utilizes the nickel strain. Um, here, you infect rabbit with treponema pallidum, so you get the organism. And then you have also a, an FDA sorbent test. Uh, it is prepared from the culture of writer's treponym and the fluorescent labeled anti-human globulin. And a positive reaction is characterized by the presence of fluorescent treponins. So the principle is that here you have the organisms provided as part of the reagent kit, and then you add patient serum. If the patient is positive for syphilis, his antibodies will bind with the organism. And then you add the anti-human immune globulin, which will attach at the FC portion of the patient antibodies. So since it is fluorescent labeled, what will happen is that the organisms will fluoresce. And this is an example of a positive reaction. So there would be fluorescent organisms, which you have to observe under the microscope. So here is an example of a positive reaction. Sources of errors include cross-contamination, improper alignment of microscopes, uh, use of repeatedly thawed antigen slides, test limitation, there's a chance of a transient false positive. So that's, that's why doctors would usually um, correlate this with the actual clinical conditions and history of the patient. Systemic discoid and drug-induced lupus erythematosus may also affect the result. It is also reactive in other trepanomatoses such as yos and tinta, and reactive among elderly. 
So it's not reliable among elderly patients. The other one is Traponema pallidum immobilization. This is considered as the reference test for Traponema pallidum. What do you mean by the term immobilization class? What do you mean by the term immobilization? Do you have any idea? When you say immobilization, what does it mean? You make it non-motile. Okay, so that's what, that's what we meant by immobilization. So when you say immobilization, you make it non-motile. Which means you need a moving organism or a motile organism. And for you to have a motile organism, the antigen that you have to use is a live treponema pallidum. Where can you get live treponema pallidum? You can get it from the testicular chancre of rabbit, which means that if you are a laboratory and you are doing this test, you must have a rabbit. And your rabbit should have syphilis. Diba? <clears throat> um, it's quite tedious to have this test. Though it's the reference test, it is not routinely being performed. So a positive result is immobilization of treponema pallidum. Here, you have motile organisms. These organisms are motile. And then you add patient's antibody, patient serum. If the, if the serum is positive for antibody, what will happen is that the antibody will bind with, will bind with organisms. And because of this, the organisms will not anymore be motile. Do you understand? But if the, if the person is negative for antibodies, so the organisms will keep on having motility. So if you're using the treponema pallidum, will it be a false positive or false negative? Huh? If it's dead treponema pallidum, it will become false positive. Because the organisms are not moving if they're dead, and you might think that, oh, the patient has syphilis. So it's very important to have a very good quality control when you're using the TPI. And the disadvantage is that it doesn't distinguish other trepanomatoses, which means that clinicians should, should correlate this with the actual clinical presentations and the history of the patient. So, of course, here is an example of non-motile organisms, non-motile because this is not a GIF, and you are not in Hogwarts. Okay. Other treponemal tests would include MHATP, microhemagglutination treponema pallidum. Here, you are using lyophilized formalinized tan ships RBC that has been sensitized with treponema pallidum. So, if you're able to cause agglutination of the ship's RBC, which serves as the indicator, it means that a person is positive for syphilis. And then, the treponema pallidum, complement fixation. You're also using triter strain, and since it is a complement fixation test, a positive reaction is characterized by the presence of no hemolysis. Okay? It is non-reactive in the late stage of syphilis. So here is an example of a positive reaction on MHATP. So the presence of agglutination is considered as a positive reaction. Tarponema pallidum hemagglutination, almost the same principle as TP MHATP, except that you're not using a micro titer well trained. So here, the tarponema pallidum is the antigen. And then, TPHA means that you're also using RBC as the indicator, and you're able to detect antibodies against cellular components. So, here's another example of a positive TPHA. New tests for syphilis would include enzyme immunoassay. Um, Stevens have actually discussed that thoroughly in your book. Western blood. Okay, and then PCR, of course, is very reliable, though very expensive. So, interpretation of the results based on where tests will be used. So, if it's a if you're going at the low, if you're testing low risk population, 
What do you mean by low risk population? Those people who do not have history. Okay? So you should have, uh, it must be confirmed right away. Must, uh, and then, results should be interpreted according to the stage of the disease. Whether you are referring to the primary, secondary, late, latent stage. Um, during the early stage, 30% is, 30% would actually be non-reactive. So you have to repeat it one week and then three months after. During the secondary stage, nearly all reactive. So the titer is about more than eight dilutions. One is to eight dilutions. Then during the late latent stage, 20% of the populations are non-treponemal tests, non-reactive in non-treponemal tests such as in RPR, in VDRL, but 86% would be reactive in treponemal tests for life. Okay, when you are in the late latent stage. Um, if a person is pregnant, it has to be confirmed with treponemal test. And if reactive, it should be treated so that you prevent congenital syphilis from happening. Okay? When used to follow therapy, you have to perform three months interval for at least one year. At, um, there should be at least fourfold decline on the third and fourth months. Ano ibig sabihin ng at least four, fourfold decline? Yung tighter. Kung wari, ang baseline mo, ang baseline mo ay 64. 1 is to 64 during the initial. Tapos after therapy, yung antibody mo naging 1 is to 4 na lang. So, paano nyo malalaman kung ilang decline ng tighter? E di ano, 64 over 4. Ano yung 64 over 4? Ha? 16. So, 16-fold yung decrease. Para malaman mo na naging uh, na, na okay yung therapy, dapat yung antibodies mo na decrease in less, uh, less than 4-fold. Four 4-fold four decrease in antibodies. Para at least, ibig sabihin bumaba na apat na beses yung tighter ng antibodies mo. Okay? So, kung ganon, naging effective yung therapy. And then, kapag eight-fold decline naman on the six and eight month of the late latent stage. So, four-fold during the third and fourth month, eight-fold during the six and eighteenth month. So, kung ganito yung scenario, it's not even four-fold or eight-fold, sixteen-fold decrease. Yun yung ibig sabihin nun. Okay? So, eventually, magde-decline na yung antibody titer. Lower titer persists at least 50 years after 2 years. 50% after 2 years. So, naging effective yung therapy ng patient. Okay, what would be the indicator na na-reinfect yung patient? Is it possible? Yes. Reinfection is possible. So, reinfection indicator means that there has been fourfold increase in the titer. Nag-increase naman yung titer. So, pag nag-increase yung titer, it means that there has been reinfection. And if there has been reinfection, therefore, kailangan ng re-treatment. Okay? So, this is now the algorithm. So, clinicians will usually check for lesions. If there is a lesion, then you can do the direct uh, fluorescent assay. If it's reactive or positive, then you have to treat the patient. Kapag negative naman, although merong lesions, you have to do the non-treponemal test. Kapag non-reactive, hindi syphilis yun. Baka iba, baka hemophilus docreyi. Or baka ibang, ibang, ibang infection or ibang condition. But kapag reactive, you have to check the titer and do the treponemal test. Kasi nga, ang treponemal test is confirmatory. If it's positive, then you have to treat. And then if it's negative, baka biological false positive result lang. So tingnan ninyo ha, kapag non-treponemal test, ang interpretation natin either reactive or non-reactive. Maliwanag yan? Okay, you do not use the term positive or negative in non-treponemal test. We're only using that in treponemal test. Clear? Okay. Other important notes, 
When laboratory results contradict physician's opinion or the patient's history, a repeat specimen should be submitted. So very important yung, 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 yung patient history. Okay, the diagnosis of syphilis should be based on serological test as well as history, physical examination, and a plausible explanation for the source of infection. Baka naman madre siya na walang, na walang history of sexual intercourse, parang pinagpipilitan niya na may syphilis siya. Tapos hindi naman siya nagpapablood transfusion, di ba? So there should be a plausible explanation. Unless nagsisinungaling yung pasyente. 